Hello everyone, I'm Chris Hernandez and this is the Weekly Report, a look at news from the city of Kansas City, Missouri. The streetcar started rolling just five months ago, but it has already hit the millionth ride milestone. The streetcar now averages about 6,600 rides per day as ridership continues to climb. Last week, the city celebrated with a community gathering at 14th and Main by the streetcar stop in the Power and Light District. The City Council has passed an ordinance that allows the Veterans Community Project to build 50 tiny houses for homeless veterans. The four-acre property near 89th and Troost was purchased from the Kansas City Land Bank. The city has been a wonderful collaborator on this project. They have helped us become you know, the first village of tiny houses built within city limits that I'm aware of in America. It's just a more cost-effective way to attack the problem from our perspective. The houses are tiny, but this is the largest project of its kind in the nation and the first development of tiny houses in Kansas City. And from South Kansas City to the Northland, where the Twin Creeks development is the site of a design contest. Three design firms have been selected to present their concepts for creating parks along the creeks in an area that has just opened up for new development. Uh, we have first Antonio Plitza, uh, uh, Plitza from uh, Borba, Portugal. Antonio's design proposed public spaces uh, to connect people with the creeks, a sequence of parks that preserves forest and protects against flooding with ponds and meadows uh, that are guided by the local ecology. Uh, Gabriel Coyar and Arthur uh, Mofre of Brooklyn, New York, they proposed three intervening trails with, for cyclists and pedestrians bridges over the creeks and public spaces to connect adjacent neighborhoods and the park together. Small Wonders is a design team of Liam Mahoney and Charles McDowell from Seattle uh, and New York City. Uh, they proposed a design focused on the monarch butterfly habitats and opportunities for environmental education through the linear park. I also want to just tell you that this is really an exciting opportunity to see something brand new, uh, to see something creative spring up in an area that uh, has serious potential. The winning designs will help the city develop the adjacent 15,000 acres by incorporating trails, stormwater management, transportation, and other amenities. KC Water wins another award. The Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies recognized the Kansas City Water Services Department with its Platinum Award for Utility Excellence. Well, I'm very pleased that the uh, Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies has recognized us with a Platinum Award. Uh, water Services has strived uh, very hard in the last four or five years to become a professional, data-driven, customer-centric organization, and I think this award recognizes that effort. By using data, the Water Department has established an evidence-based approach to improving infrastructure, maintenance, and customer service in the last five years. Now let's check in with some of our city's departments. water th throughout our entire farming operation. We irrigate to some degree uh, most all of our crops. We also use it in processing where we prepare our salad greens, wash our carrots, wash our beets, and do uh, just general sanitation work around the farm. We use uh, just tap water. It needs to be potable water in the distillery as cooling water. I use it one time there. We collect it and I'll either use it again in making a mash or we collect it outside and I take it to the hogs or I take it to the sheep. We use it any time we have a dry spell, uh, and especially when we uh, first uh, get ready to plant for the season and the, the water to get our plants a jump start. And this is probably the most important time to have the water, especially when you're transplanting. Start a plant because you need to keep them moist for a few days or a week. Now, if we didn't have water, we wouldn't be in business. We wouldn't even be here. Did you know that the Metropolitan Community College's Maple Woods campus is the birthplace of the Kansas City Storytelling Celebration, now in its 17th year, and that it has grown to over 225 performances throughout the Kansas City area? 
Here to tell us about this four-day event that is supported by the Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund is Heather Bettis, who is the Community Relations Coordinator for Maple Woods Community College and is also the coordinator for this event. Heather, thank you for having us here today. Oh, thanks for coming out. We really appreciate it. Heather, you have been with involved with the storytelling celebration for 16 years of the 17 years that it's been around. How did the storytelling celebration get started? And um, give us give us some background on on how it's grown. Well, thank you so much for asking. Yeah, there's a rich history behind this celebration, and I'm really proud to talk about those folks that kind of put it together. Steve Otto was a local storyteller, and he worked here at the campus in the community education department, and he taught storytelling classes. Well, he got together with Joyce Slater, who is our artistic director, still to this day, 17 years later, and with our former president, Dr. Myrna Solomon. And they had a conversation about how storytelling could grow in the community and why it's such a vital part of the community. So they got together and here we are 17 years later after that conversation back in 1998, still going around and telling stories to lots of folks. And how many storytellers are involved this year? Actually, we have a little over 40. We're looking at about 44. And that includes our featured storytellers who come from all over the United States. And then the other 40 tellers are regional tellers from here around in the four state Midwest area. area. Mm -hmm. And how are they selected from year to year? Actually, Joyce Slater does a fabulous job in doing that. She listens to those tellers. She goes out and she finds those tellers are gonna fit within the communities that we have that we tell stories in. So she's very good at kind of listening, seeing where the storytellers' talents, where their music, their drama, their theater, all fit into the scheme of where we go throughout the community. And where do you go from if you're if we're giving a, a perspective of um, of the parameters of the of the celebration? Where are these 225 performances taking place? Well, we're very blessed to have a site committee that gives us all the destinations and locations that we go to. We go as far out as Overland Park, Kansas, to as far north from south to north, out to Platte City, and then we bring the nucleus of our programs into the Kansas City metro area. And what are some of the locations in the Kansas City metro area? The Kansas City metro area, we go into the Guadalupe Center, the juvenile detention centers, we go into a lot of the schools. Um, a lot of our supporters from the site committee are from schools, North and Kansas City School District, Fort Osage, um, Liberty. We work with a lot of different community school districts to make sure we get the message out there. And then we also work with the three major library systems here mm -hmm. in Kansas City, Missouri. Kansas City, Missouri Public Library, Kansas City, Kansas Public Library and the Mid-Continent Public Libraries, of which there are 37 branches. So we work with them to get out not only into the schools, but also into their library systems. So we're very, very lucky to have them as on our site committee to help us choose where we go. So how many people are you anticipating attending the celebration over the four days? Actually, the most wonderful thing about the Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund is they give us the opportunity to reach out outside of our community to bring folks in. So we look outside of Kansas City. We have um, a family actually that comes from Glen Ellen, Illinois, and they bring they bring a van full of people to come, and that's through the help and support of NTDF. Um, so we. We'll probably bring in this year close to twenty-five to 28,000 folks to hear stories in not only because of the libraries, because of the schools, but also at our various public free events. And for those people that are wanting to come in town, they can look at a free public schedule on our website at caseystorytelling.org. That's caseystorytelling.org. We hope you'll go out there and take a look at the schedule. Absolutely. There's so much to see on, on your website as well. And Thank with, you. for the videos and the and the and the photos to give people an idea of what to expect also and, and just the multiple locations that you cover. So thank you all for what you do. And thank you for bringing so many people to Kansas City so that we continue to to share the story of our city with everyone who visits. Thank you so much. The Neighborhood Tourist Development Fund supports local nonprofits that bring cultural, social, educational, and recreational activities to our area.
about additional upcoming events, visit kcmo.gov ntdf. The Kansas City, Missouri Police Department is inviting citizens to come and chat and enjoy a free cup of coffee. This international program, called Coffee with a Cop, brings police officers and the community members they serve together over coffee to discuss issues and learn more about each other. Master Patrol Officer Rick Cartwright of the Shoal Creek Patrol Division describes how it works. It's just a um, non-agenda type program where uh, officers sit down with the public and just chat about anything and everything. Um, the idea is to do just that, not necessarily uh, talk about any one particular thing, just whatever might arise. And usually, of course, it, it's police related one way or another, or neighborhood related, but uh, it morphs into other things too. Coffee with a Cop was launched in Hawthorne, California in 2011. Members of the Hawthorne Police Department were looking for ways to interact more effectively with the public. Officer Cartwright hopes to do the same here. No agenda, no speeches, just conversation. The objective, of course, is to just have that time with, with the public in a non-intimidating atmosphere where they can talk openly about those different things that are going on in their neighborhood, things that are going on in their city. Um, with that uh, website, like I told you about, that uh, you could probably go across the country and find some coffee with a cop um, venue that you could go to and, and uh, meet officers from across the country if you wanted to. Community policing has long been considered a valuable tool for establishing trust between the community and police. Martin Shutpoles of the Sherwood Estates Home Association came out to share his concerns and likes the idea of coffee with a cop. Nobody bit me. <laughs> they don't bite. Not that I'm aware of. Um, the they're pretty friendly people in general, and I think you'd be surprised. It's a welcoming atmosphere, at least it was today, and it, uh, I think everybody here enjoyed it, and it was good coffee. Coffee with a Cop events have been hosted in all 50 states, and has also expanded to outside the United States, to Canada, Europe, Australia, and Africa, and meetings don't have to be held at a coffee shop. KCPD has hosted several so far with more to come. Look for Coffee with a Cop coming to a location near you. I'm Sergeant Matt Fisher. Have a safe week. We are ready to start. Um, my name is Ben Charda. I'm the Executive Director for Kansas City Community Gardens. And we are here today to do something really fun. We are going to break some ground. Um, it's funny, but I thought this day would never come. And I, I say that because, not because it took a long time to get the building permit or anything like that. Um, that's all cool. Um, but because when we moved here in 2002, we moved into this big building. We had all this office space, room for like 12, 15 people. We only had three people on our staff. So I thought we would never outgrow this space. But we have outgrown that space. We now have like 27 people on our staff, and we've grown in other ways too. Um, back in 2002, we were working with about 600 low-income families that had gardens across the city. Now we're working with about 1,400. So that's some growth. Um, at that point, we were working with like 39 different community garden groups. Now we have 256 community garden groups, of which over 30 of them are youth gardens. Um, at that time, we had eight school gardens that we were working with. Now we have 206 school gardens. And these are school gardens all over the city, all different grades, ages, uh, public schools, private schools, charter schools. And um, at that time, we had no community orchards. And now we have 102, 102 um, Giving Grove community orchards around the city. So that's our newest program. And of course, we have our lovely Beanstalk Children's Garden. Uh, we just had a big fall family festival last week. Annually, we're getting about 4,000 visitors to that garden. So we have grown a lot, and we're excited to do this new building. Yay! Yay! 
this shows the true relationship and the cooperation among the PIAC committee members to pull all their money from all six districts to make that happen, which simply says this is a citywide endeavor. And it's citywide because it's important of all the community groups, all the volunteer labor, all the grassroots organizations, all the neighbors that make this happen. And of course, we know it's important to be able to you know, grow fruit and vegetables and all the things that make for healthy living. And healthy living is what it's all about. And then of course, a lot of the social engagement that takes place. So thank you for the time this morning. Uh, great applause to your efforts and all the good work that's been done in the past all the good work that will be done in the future to make this another ongoing Kansas City, Missouri success story. Thank you. One of the things that I look at and I see as I um, kind of look at the crowd that has assembled here is that it's an extreme diverse crowd. And that is one of the things that's going to help the entire city grow as we try to grow food and, and other things within our, our communities, particularly in a lot of the lots that we have in the, in the urban core. So if we can all band together and do things just like this, we'll continue to be able to grow the city and we'll be a more unified city. So I appreciate being able to be a part of this effort. So thank you all for coming and, and keep up the good work. Hi, I'm Janet O'Hagan with Kansas City Convention and Entertainment Facilities bringing you news of upcoming events taking place at your city facilities. Kansas City's most exciting charity boxing event, Guns and Hoses, powered by the Kansas City Crime Commission, is coming back to the Kansas City Convention Center Grand Ballroom on October 21st. Police officers, firefighters, and EMT paramedics will square off in the ring to see who will reign victorious. All proceeds benefit the Kansas City Crime Commission Surviving Spouse and Family Endowment Fund, providing financial assistance to the spouses and children of those who make the ultimate sacrifice for our safety. Go to KansasCityGunsAndHoses.com for ticketing and event information. The annual Holiday Mart, a Kansas City holiday tradition, returns to Bartle Hall October 20th through the 23rd. Holiday Mart is the Junior League of Kansas City, Missouri largest fundraiser. This upscale shopping extravaganza has been a fall tradition for 28 years and is an extra special destination event with over 200 specialty retailers and over 20,000 shoppers. For ticketing and additional information about the event, go to www.jlkc.org. On Friday, November 4th, Kansas City metro area students from middle school age through college are encouraged to participate in the 5th Annual Sleepless in the City project. Sleepless in the City is a private sleepout created to raise awareness to the issues of youth homelessness in Kansas City. During the sleepout, students will gather at the Convention Center's Barney Alice Plaza to practice firsthand how and why people experience homelessness by spending the night outside. Parents, teachers, community leaders, civic leaders, and city officials are encouraged to take part in the event as well. These are just a few of the many events the Kansas City Convention and Entertainment Facilities offers our community. To learn about even more events, visit kcconvention.com and click on the events calendar or call 816 513-5000. Hello, it's Beth Brinstein. I'm live at Maplewood and Maple Park Schools up north, and we're celebrating brand new sidewalks. As you can see, the kids are already walking along the brand new sidewalks. Just had a dedication ceremony out here celebrating brand new sidewalks. Since I took office a year ago, we had said we want to build sidewalks because you guys are the ones who need to have the opportunity to walk to school and walk to the playground and walk to places you want to be in a safe way. It was a unique project because the Full Employment Council used it as an opportunity for jobs training. So we had some of the members who actually laid down the concrete out here celebrating with us today. This was really an opportunity and partnership to see what we could do to improve the infrastructure around here in this area where 
more than one thing could be accomplished, and I think we did that admirably. We're also celebrating International Walk to School Day. We're excited to be a part of it in the Public Works Department. I'm Beth Brittenstein with Channel 2 News. Fall is a great time for neighborhood cleanups, and now your neighborhood group can dispose of old tires for free. Tire amnesty collections are usually held the first Saturday of each month. This fall, the city is adding extra dates to provide extra cleanup opportunities. Neighborhood organizations can drop off tires at the city's environmental campus at 4707 Doremus on November 5th or November 19th. Additionally, tire trailers will be placed at Concourse Park in the historic Northeast neighborhood on October 29th. The city's annual America Recycles event will also be held on November 5th. That's at Manual Tech Career Center, which is at 1320 Truman Road, and it runs from 8 in the morning until noon. Residents can bring tires, but they can also bring paint, small appliances, electronics, building materials, and clothing. This is an annual recycling event. For additional information about these tire events, go to kcmo.gov and search tires. Now, speaking of cleanup, the city's fall curbside leaf and brush pickup begins in the south zone on the week of October 24th. Collection moves to the central zone the week of October 31st through November 4th, and Northland residents can set out their leaves and brush the week of November 14th. A second round of collection runs from late November through mid-December. And please remember, you may leave up to 20 bags or bundles of leaves and brush at the curb on your regular trash pickup day. The city's leaf and brush drop-off sites are also now open. The sites are located at 11660 North Main, 1815 North Choteau Trafficway, and 10301 Raytown Road. Drop-off is free to residents on Saturdays with identification. And for more information about leaf and brush, visit kcmo.gov and search leaf and brush. Due to the Veterans Day holiday on Friday, November 11th, trash pickup for residents whose regular trash day is on that Friday will have their trash picked up one day later on Saturday, November 12th. That does it for this edition of the Weekly Report. To view this program again or other Channel 2 videos, go to kcmo.gov and search Channel 2. That page has a link to our YouTube channel and all of our great programs which you can view on demand. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris Hernandez. Have a great week.